Good. Thanks very much. Okay, so we're ready. We're ready to go live then. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and well, welcome to the special session of Council for July the 12th, 2022. Uh, it is a special session of Council because normally in July, the town does not have a regular session of Council, but we always leave space for one in case there are things that need to be dealt with, which of course is the purpose of this meeting. I will call the meeting to order. It is being live streamed on the town's YouTube channel. If you wish to follow along on the agenda, you can do so by going to our website, greaternapanee.com. Uh, I will look for an adoption of the agenda, but I would like to make uh, one change if we could. I would like to move 8.2 and 8.3 to follow 7.2. Point two, please. I would look for a motion for the adoption of the agenda as amended. Deputy Mayor Kaiser, Councillor Johnson, all in favor of that motion? Motion is carried, thank you. Any disclosure of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof? Seeing none. Public meeting under the Planning Act. I need a resolution, please, to convene the public meeting under the Planning Act. Moved by Councillor Pinnell, seconded by Councillor McCormack. All in favor of that motion? Motion is carried, thank you. Bob, I'll try to keep uh, an eye on you for asking questions. If I miss you, just please call out and, and I'll make sure that I catch it. Michael, please go ahead. Thank you, Worship. Uh, this evening, um, Council will be holding a public meeting under the Planning Act uh, to hear a proposed rezoning application for the property known municipally as 21 Pleasant Drive in Selby, um, located uh, immediately north of TCO and uh, immediately south of TCO. The property actually wraps around TCO uh, Agrimart to the north and then to the south. Um, the lands were previously uh, subject to a consent approval application um, in late 2021 where the Committee of Adjustment uh, provided provisional approval for the creation of a lot at the southerly, uh, southerly end of the property. Um, as a condition of that provisional approval, um, the lands to be retained and the lands to be severed were both uh, required to be rezoned. The lands to the south, uh, so the severed parcel, um, were required to be rezoned based on the proximity to the Lafarge Quarry immediately across the road. Uh, the intention here is to uh, remove any possible sensitive land uses due to the proximity of that extractive uh, industrial operation. And the lands to the north, um, through the review of the consent application, it was noted that um, the operation, the current operation of the Lennox Fence uh, business on the properties is unfortunately uh, not in compliance with the zoning bylaw as it stands today. So the requirement was that uh, attention be given to the, the retained property. And um, that is part of the uh, public meeting this evening. And I believe the applicant's agent, Jason Sands, is in attendance who will be speaking to uh, the application as proposed uh, this evening. So I would invite Mr. Sands up and uh, he can give uh, council an overview of the proposal and any questions can be uh, directed either to Mr. Sands or to myself. Thank you. Thank you, uh, okay. thank you Jason. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Mr. Nobes. The, uh, there's a PowerPoint presentation that's been prepared, prepared for this evening's agenda. Um, it's fairly lengthy in, in scale, and I don't know if it's entirely necessary for what you have already heard tonight and you've already seen with respect to consent applications before you last fall. However, I can run through it very quickly uh, and answer any questions that you may have at that time. The subject property, as you know, uh, is the home of Lennox Fencing in Selby, Ontario, north of 401 by approximately four kilometers on, uh, oh. Oh, it's oh, it's sorry. It's identi sorry. It's identified on the map here with the red, red dot. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with that site, there's uh, 
several like-minded uh, or consistent compatible uses in the area. There's a Lafarge quarry to the west side of County Road 41, an automotive dealership to the south, um, at Bob, Bob Marks uh, equipment dealership, uh, heavy equipment uh, a dealership on the western side as well. And to the north, as you move into the hamlet uh, of Selby, you get into the more of the residential uses. Uh, there's some agricultural uses uh, in that area as well as a greenhouse. This, uh, this slide here depicts the, or illustrates the proposed lot creation that uh, Mr. Nobes had already alluded to earlier. The southernmost portion that, that loops around the TCO Agrimart site is proposed to be subdivided and subject to that consent approval we're here before you seeking to rezone, um, which is a 7.7 .7 hectare site. Um, the northern portion is 10.5 hectares in, in area, and we're attempting to legalize that existing Lennox fencing business uh, with a significant investment into the community as it's currently established out of some ATCO trailers in a temporary state. state. I've already ran through the uh, neighboring uses, but uh, the slide shows an overview just contextually. And as Mr. Nobes had already alluded to, you can see the extent of the Lafarge quarry adjacent to the site on the western side of County Road 41. Hence the reason for uh, comments from Lafarge Canada uh, seeking the exclusion of residential or sensitive land uses. And, and through this application, the proposal is that they be removed uh, or prohibited on that proposed severed parcel identified in blue in the southern portion of the subject lands. With respect to the hierarchy and the assessment given from a land use compatibility perspective, we've started at the provincial level and look at the provincial policy statement. The provincial policy statement contains several policies that are applicable to this project, and a couple of them are highlighted on the screen, not to get into the detail uh, or minutia of the, of the policies, but there are several economic development policies that are included within the provincial policy statement, and they seek to drive uh, variation of uses, so industrial, commercial, residential, into rural settlement areas, which this proposal seeks to do. Through the, through the fact that the portion of the, the northern portion of the lands in which are rezoned and accommodates the Lenox Fence site is located entirely within the uh, Hamlet or Rural Settlement Area of Selby. The next slide, and going back to that hierarchy of land use planning in Ontario, moves down to the County of Lenox Nannington's official plan. Um, the county has many several policies that are consistent with what we have at a lower tier level, the town OP, um, but we also have some, some varied use uh, policies just given on the date in which this plan was adopted. So section B9 of the, of the county's OP contains three policies that really seek to, to drive that economic development again, which aligns to the provincial policy statements into our rural settlement areas that are outside of our urban service areas, such as uh, the town south of 401. Moving through to the town's official plan, as you can see, it's it's dual zone, uh, dual designated actually. So the northern portion is, as I mentioned, within the settlement area, whereas the southern portion is simply within a rural designation. So there's a site-specific zone that's proposed for the severed parcel and a site-specific zone that's proposed for the northern parcel, and they differ in what uses are being proposed so that we can confirm that they align to the official plan policies that you currently have in effect as some of those are identified here on the screen, section 4.4. Just diving into some further policy in the official plan at the town's level, section 4.8.1.4 contains several applicable policies specific to this project because they're commercial and industrial policies as it relates to intensifying or, or diversifying, if you will, our rural settlement areas. Um, I'm not gonna run through all these A to H, but essentially, in, in my opinion, um, the proposal that's before you this evening augmented with further site plan control applications to further mitigate things like lighting and stormwater management. Um, it, it, it draws parallel to what these policies are seeking to uh, establish in our, in our rural areas. So therefore, in summary, it's, it's our opinion that this proposal is consistent with the town's official plan and the vision for your rural settlement areas, including Selby. Just moving through that uh, policy hierarchy, it's not necessarily a policy of the province, but it's a guideline, and there's a D series guideline. I have three slides on it in this PowerPoint, and by no means am I gonna get into detail. But the D series, the D6 series specifically, guidelines 
are applicable to industrial facilities and when they're in, located in close proximity to a residential facility or a sensitive land use, these document, uh, this document and these policies are applicable just to ensure that there's appropriateness with respect to noise, di dust and vibration and that there's not going to be or not anticipated to be an adverse effect from those uh, uses which are uh, in close proximity to one another. The province through that D6 assessment uh, has three different classes of uh, essential facility and just industrial and commercial facilities. Based on my review and um, of, of what's being proposed, this is a class one facility for industrial land uses. Uh, and with that, it's a minimum requirement of a 20 meter separation distance from any sensitive adjacent land use. This slide confirms that the closest single family dwelling at 54 Pleasant Drive is 95 meters away from what's being proposed on the subject property and in, in turning that facility into a, from an ATCO trailer to a proposed development site or a permanent building site. And the property address of 57 Pleasant Drive is located 110 meters from the proposed development on the retained parcel. So those two setbacks not only exceed the requirement of the D series guidelines for a class one facility, they exceed the requirements of a class two facility. Um, so in short, uh, it's our opinion that they're consistent or what's being proposed before you this evening is consistent with the D series assessment uh, at the provincial level. From a zoning bylaw perspective, as uh, Mr. Nobes alluded to earlier, the Lennox fencing site is actually contrary to what you currently have in your zoning bylaw. It's a rural zone and a rural zone doesn't permit such establishment as of right. There was never a site specific zone created at the time of its creation and what we're doing here before you this evening is trying to legalize that operation in further investing into your community by establishing a permanent structure. So the uses that are identified in the screen, residential uses as well as non-residential uses are the extent of those in which are permitted on the subject property and none of those in my opinion allow for what's being accommodated on site currently. These are some photos of the existing situation. So the top left photo shows those temporary structures or ATCO trailers in which accommodate the current operation. The bottom photo uh, is taken from Pleasant Drive and it shows the uh, existing outdoor storage associated with the Lennox fencing operation, um, as well as the existing coverall buildings that you see in the, into the rear, the, the, the white buildings. Those are actually buildings that belong to the uh, TCO Agrimar site but they're very similar and consistent to what's being proposed before you tonight through uh, self-storage uses. And the, the photo in the top right corner on the screen is the access off of County Road 41 at the southernmost extent of the subject lands. And that's the proposed severed parcel that it was subject to the consent application in which you heard last fall. It's a 20 acre site approximately. It's currently vacant, it's used for agricultural uses and there's no proposed development at this time, but there's a proposed zoning in front of you uh, and, and this council um, based on the comments received from Lafarge for excluding any residential or sensitive land uses. So really what this application entails is creating two site specific zones. So an RU-XX zone on the severed parcel. So again, on that severed parcel on the southern extent um, and there, like I mentioned, they're coming from the Lafarge, they're driving the Lafarge comments to ensure that there's no residential use accommodated in that, that would further inhibit any future expansion or operation with the dust and, and, and uses associated with their quarry operation. But at the same time, and being proactive as opposed to reactive in understanding what may future development wise be established on that property, we've built in some, perform, some uh, permissions uh, in non-residential uses, such as a building supply center, a contractor's yard. Those are, those are very consistent with what you'd see in the area, i.e. Jim Spinks Motors down to the south of the property, Bob Marks uh, Equipment Dealership to the west of the property. Uh, that, th those would be you know, largely considered a, a contractor's yard by definition of your existing zoning. So those are being considered to be included within this site-specific zone at this time. All that being said, there's no development proposed um, on site at, at this time and we would anticipate site plan control to regulate those aspects of future development at the time of, of future development. The retained parcel, the RU-YY is a, or XY, sorry, is a site specific zone that we're proposing for the, the retained parcel which accommodates the Lennox fencing operation. Um, it, 
again, as I mentioned, it sort of tries to bring into effect what is already operational, a building supply center, contract yard, commercial garage, those, those types of um, uses by definition in your zoning bylaw uh, are already, again, consistent with what you would see or want as an economic driver in your rural settlement area, and that's what's being proposed. The one addition that you might be off and catch you as, as a non-existing is a self-storage facility. And as you know, there's always a need for self-storage and the applicant actually believes it in this case so much so that he's proposing three cover-all buildings um, that are 85 by 150 square uh, feet in, in area, I believe, um, for the storage of RVs, boats, that kind of thing. Not your traditional storage locker like you'd see on Drive and Road, but more of a, of a RV or a, a storage building just simply in an open coverall type building. So that's the assess, the inclusion for self-storage. As we're creating a site-specific zone on that retained parcel, not only are we proposing to introduce new uses, we're proposing to introduce new performance standards so that we can ensure that they're adequately accommodated on that property um, and not necessarily out of context again. Your official plan has policies to ensure that it's consistent with the streetscape and the buildings that uh, maintain parking in the side or the rear, for example, and that's what we're trying to accommodate in some of these st performance standards that uh, are, are incorporated within this uh, site-specific RU-XY zone. This um, slide here illustrates the proposed site plan. As I mentioned, the access, that's or the, the access that's existing from Pleasant Drive is proposed to be maintained. There's no change in that the location that the existing trailers are, are located would be proposed to be removed, and that's where this um, larger 75 foot by 50 foot shop or, or, or commercial building that would house Lennox fencing um, would be accommodated. And as you can see, all the, the on-site vehicular movements, loading bays, parking, access, et cetera, is all driven into the side and the rear with a septic out front to maintain a, a streetscape that's, that's highly um, aesthetically pleasing, if you will. To the north of the property along the side, you see a stormwater management plan, that's, or pond, sorry, as well as the three coverall buildings to immediately to the east of that pond and along the road is an existing dug well. Um, some of you may be questioning the water supply and, and, and the use of water. There's not anticipated to be any change from what you see on site today, largely with the uses that are being proposed through the zoning in the fact that it's to legalize what's there. The number of employees are proposed to remain the same. It's just to be operating out of a purpose-built building as opposed to a, I'll call it a haphazard build with temporary trailers. And just to summarize, apologize for the time, it's, uh, it's my opinion that the assessment as it concludes from the provincial level all the way down through the county and town's official plan um, back to the, to the provincial D-series guidelines have all been complied with and respected and what you have before you represents good land use planning. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Council, go ahead, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Worship. I have three. Um, I'd ask uh, Mr. Sands to uh, compare or make comments regarding the proposed non-residential uses in contrast or even in comparison to the existing permitted non-uses like a wayside pit or quarry. I mean, is it really changing the risk or, um, I don't know, invasiveness of the, of the uses? Maybe that's not the right word, but I think you know what I'm meaning. Through you. Um, sorry, Deputy, Re Deputy Mayor did, Kaiser. I, looking I, at looking understand. at a contractor's yard in a storage yeah. area compared to a wayside pit or quarry, which is a permitted use on that property, yeah. is it really taking a large step to a greater use or a more, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but a more controversial use? I don't know. I, through you, I think the with respect to the residential component of this, it's proposed to be prohibited to ensure that it's not going to adversely affect any of the future expansion of neighboring uses. The contractor yard, building supply outlet type uses are what we see as by definition already existing in the area. Um, if there's the 
desire, if you will, to create a new site-specific definition uh, for what we're proposing in terms of a commercial shop building on the retained parcel. More than happy to consider it and work through that with staff. Um, if it's catching, if, it, if, if some of the definitions, for example, like contractor's yard or commercial garage are what is maybe causing question, it's, it's simply because they were pulled from the general provision and definition section of the current O2 bylaw. Okay. I don't know if uh, I... Second one. Um, so in this proposal, a future site plan agreement would include things like storm water mansion ponds, which you see on the diagram. Uh, that proposal shows the storm water management pond in fairly close proximity to the existing farm to the north side, which has horses and livestock. What's the p possible risk or... Is there a consideration to possibly move that to a spot that we might be less uh, sensitive to that, the existing livestock and, and their water sources? Uh, through you, I'll start and let Mr. Nobes follow up. I just, uh, this is a conceptual plan at this time, Deputy Reeve, and uh, there's by no means a assurances that that has to be the desired location of the pond. I don't believe there's been a full topo topographical survey completed yet to date to understand that that is the location. Um, it, it could be subject to move. Really, it was proposed in that location from an aesthetics perspective as being a green space in the front yard or adjacent to, to uh, Pleasant Drive as opposed to um, a continuation with open storage area, which is more <coughs> unesthetically pleasing in, in that given location. And uh, j just to follow up, um, any time that uh, new development's proposed, in this instance, there's a proposal to create um, substantial amount of, I'll call it asphalt um, surface or um, essentially any surface that could have a higher rate of runoff than grass that were there previously. Um, the post-development uh, discharge of storm flows needs to uh, be at a maximum rate of what it was previously. So. Any, any stormwater flows leaving the site cannot be in excess of what they were pre-development. So the pre-development flows would be identified and uh, through the site plan review application uh, in that process, both with town engineering uh, peer reviewers and community conservation peer reviewers, we would confirm that um, stormwater flows would not be negatively impacting neighboring properties. That would be my concern. Thank you. I'm good there. Okay. I'll go with Councillor McCormack, please. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm just curious, uh, I know it's a, in the initial stages, and Lafarge have commented about the residential component. Are there any other concerns from the surrounding businesses? Uh, through Your Worship, I can confirm staff have not received any comment on either the rezoning application before Council this evening or previously the consent applications. Um, and I believe that there was conversation between uh, TCO, for example, and the property owner, and there, there was no uh, uh, concern raised at that time. Lafarge was the only uh, commenting body that raised a concern uh, with regards to the new lot creation to the south. Um, and, and for good reason, I mean, they want to protect their, their, uh, their asset, which is uh, the extractive use there. So. All right, thank you. Anything further? Councillor Pinnell? Uh, thank you, through you, Mayor. Uh, Jason, uh, just uh, you, <clears throat> you told us earlier that you're classifying this as uh, D6, I think it says that it's a class one facility. And then further on when you were talking to us that uh, you were mentioning that the, the buildings that we see, the coveralls are gonna be for, for storage, like RVs and such. But a class one says on this uh, presentation that there won't be any outside storage. I'm just wondering, typically with a fencing supply that they unload the trucks and put their stuff on the ground. And of course, this is gonna to add to the noise uh, of, uh, of steel banging and clunking at seven o'clock in the morning and such. So I'm a little concerned about why it's classified as, as class one if they're more than likely will be outside storage. Through you, Madam Mayor, sure. to Councillor Pinnell. Thank you for the question. Um, with respect to the outdoor storage component, it's not, uh, it's not written in to the site-specific zoning or anticipated that any of the storage associated with a self-storage facility, if you will, would be outdoor. That would be entirely within the coverall buildings proposed. 
Um, as, and also, you can see in the photos of the existing operation, there is significant amount of outdoor storage, as you mentioned, for the fencing operation and posts and guardrails, et cetera. Um, that largely is proposed to be incorporated within the building. Um, there is not, it's a fairly large building and it's by no means an office building, if you will. This is entirely a, a shop or a commercial build that is to house the, uh, the, the operation itself. Um, so the, it, obviously I can't give assurances that there would not be the placement of some material outside, but the intent is that the, the establishment of a, a much larger facility, a purpose-built build, is to accommodate that so it allows for better year-round um, functionality of the business. Um, and by that means, it, in my opinion, was more of a class one than a class two. Um, I, the only thing I would note is if, if, for the sake of consideration, if we jump to a class two classification from a D series guideline, it's still exceeding this, the, the separation distances from neighboring sensitive land uses if we tripled up the separation distance to uh, I think it's 90, 70 meters, sorry. Okay. Just one more. Certainly. Uh, thank you, just one more. Um, was there any consideration during any of this planning to actually have the building located on the opposite piece of land, just to keep it away from the hamlet? Through you, the proposed severed parcel you're, you're speaking to? Yeah. It, it was considered, um, but it was not considered feasible by the owner. Um, the owner is Houston Guardrail and Fencing out of Kingston. They're relatively new with uh, the, the transaction of this business. Um, and the operation as it's currently established uses existing accesses to Pleasant Drive, uh, uses obviously the existing hardscaped area, the existing well location, et cetera. So the owner found efficiencies in maintaining that area of the, the northern extent of that parcel uh, as opposed to shifting all of the operation to the south end. Um, and they have no plan at this time to, to, to further develop any of that res, uh, sorry, vacant land at the southern end uh, at, at any of this time. Okay, thank you. Anything, Councillor Johnson? Thank you, Mayor. When you look at the drawings, you are referencing um, reducing the setback to only 10 meters. And in the photographs, you show the, the covered buildings that TCO Argomart already owns, and you said the new buildings would be similar to that for storage. <clears throat> the north edge of the property seems to have a tree line along it. Is there, are, are there any plans to maintain that tree line to help mitigate how much those, um, the storage buildings would stand out and to help with the aesthetics from the northern properties? Through your worship, I can, I can take that question. Um, through the site plan control application, which would be forthcoming if uh, this application moves forward with approval, um, those are the types of things that staff would be certainly be looking at are, are uh, ways in which we can ensure good buffering between this land and any, any uh, neighboring residential land uses. Um, so certainly maintaining those that tree line uh, and potentially enhancing it if it's if it's deemed uh, uh, necessary uh, would certainly be something that staff would be uh, taking into consideration and we could build in uh, clauses to the site plan agreement and ensure that those tree existing trees are, are captured on on site plan drawings to make sure that buffering is in place okay, thank you that's excellent anything further from council now this is a public meeting uh, therefore, if we have people that are with us this evening that would like to have the opportunity to ask some questions or uh, state their feelings about this, uh, I would invite them to raise their hand and I will invite them to come up to the table. Certainly, uh, I'll have, uh, go ahead, Jason, uh, just stay close by because I'm sure that some of the questions will be to you as well, please. Please come up, Pam. Pam, if you would just uh, state your name and your address for the clerk, please. Okay. It's Pam Davison, 2135 County Road 11, Selby. Okay. Right. Go ahead then, please, Pam. Thank you for having me tonight there. Um, 
Imagine the sound of beeping backup sounds from trucks and forklifts. Mortars are revving up and down. Then the noises of hollow metal pipes banging and clanging away in the early mornings and through the day. It makes you jump at times. Would you like to live next to that? We don't. The noise is coming from the northeast backside of the subject land. Even with our windows closed and very early in the morning, like 7 a.m. or earlier, you hear them. And with dying ash trees, the ash trees, uh, the tree line's getting thin. So the visibility and the sound's going to be getting worse now because they'll eventually be falling down or be cut down. I put in a complaint in late 2020 about the annoying noise coming from Lennox Fence at 6 a.m. in the morning. I received a call back from the mayor asking if it could be TCO or Lafarge I'm hearing. No, because we didn't get this problem until Lennox Fence moved in there in 2019. Plus, TCO wasn't open until 8 a.m. So how can a business set up without getting the rezoning and public notice first and allow them to stay? Uh, this snuck in quietly. Nobody else would be able to get away with that. I don't blame Houston Group <coughs> for this because they didn't know. They took the right steps. In 2019, the people of the village didn't get a say in having a contractor's yard industry in the hamlet of Selby. That should not be allowed. It is a quiet residential hamlet. There should be a buffer between them. Our homes are the biggest investment and we choose to be here in a quiet, beautiful village away from industry, noise, busy city, and 39 years later, this is what I get. Move the company to the other side and put something quieter in the hamlet. Pleasant Drive is unpleasant. The dust from Lennox, TCO, and Lafarge, uh, poor greenhouse and the homes, they're just covered in dust. And also the traffic has increased. I mean, it's hard to get out that road anymore. We usually will take another direction because there's too much traffic congestion going on. And Lennox Fence is an eyesore. When you drive by the greenhouse, like when you drive by, it's this looks pretty messy. Uh, the greenhouse, TCO, plus the residence places are all nice and tidy, look nice. We object to the outdoor storage because of noise pollution. Want storage in the buildings or a noise barrier or a berm or something and clean up the front site. Questions. In the planning justification report that you had, it was mentioned that Lennox Fence and Klein had operated on the subject property for several decades. This is not true. It came in 2019 before it was on Highway 41 where the Holland dealer is, Bob Marks. So it's only been there since 2019, set up. Uh, and that is, and also it said, and that it was historically been located within a rural zone and appeared to have operated beyond as of right zoning permission for several years. This is also not true. Look on Google Street View and you will see this. You will see that there's no buildings on your pictures up here that it wasn't there at the time when that picture was taken. So you can't say it's been there forever. Um, the other thing is, what is the proposed storage buildings for? While well, you were answering that, like I didn't know if it was for the supplies or for rentals. And what is the class number of the industrial use, which you were talking about too, so you've answered that. Please consider our quality of life here while making your decision. Sincerely, Pam and Glenn. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. Any questions or comments? from council for Pam? Oh, thank you very much, Pam. Was there anyone else that wished to speak to, uh, to this during the public meeting? Let the record show that there are none. 
Any further questions of counsel for either Michael or Jason while they're here? If not, of course, this is a public meeting with no decision to be made, so I would look then, until a later time, I would look then for a motion to adjourn the public meeting. Moved by Councilor Richardson, seconded by Councilor Pinnell. All in favor of the motion? Motion is carried. Thank you. Deputations. Um, we have a deputation with Peter Jepson this evening. Come forward, Mr. Jepson, please. Am I saying your last name properly? Jepson, yes. Oh, good. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome, and uh, thank you for bringing this forward. I'll let you uh, go ahead with your presentation, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. I'd like this evening to tell you about a couple of events that are coming, um, two related but separate events that are coming to this area in September. And the first is the World Rowing Tour. The World Rowing Federation uh, organizes world championships and things like that, for sure, but they also have a Rowing for All Commission. And the flagship event of the Rowing for All Commission is a rowing tour, which is held once a year in one part of the world or another. And um, the uh, point of this is to show that rowing is a recreational activity suitable for many, many people, not just the sort of uh, very competitive activity that we see on the television in the Olympics. Um, and Ontario Adventure Rowing, of which I am a member, is an organization that organizes tours, usually one or two-day weekend tours around Ontario for um, members of all the rowing clubs in the area uh, to take part in. Um, and so we uh, proposed to World Rowing that the World Rowing Tour be held here. Uh, the, the, the proposal was back in 2019, actually, before this whole COVID thing started. <laughs> but hopefully we're out of it by the time uh, uh, we get to the tour in September. Uh, and that was accepted. And the point of uh, proposing that it be held here was basically to show to the world that um, the Bay of Quinte is such a great place for messing around in boats. And for those who are not really familiar uh, with what I'm talking about, I'd like to show you a video. It's a short one, one and a half minutes. Um, some shots that were taken during the practice tour. Last year, OAR members rode over the uh, route um, as a practice. So yes, Bays and Islands is the name of the tour, and uh, 50 participants are coming from all around the world, from 12 different countries, for a week's rowing. Um, I also have a slide showing the route, which I'd like to show you, if that's possible. Okay. 
So it's kind of small, but um, oops, we lost it. <laughs> okay, thanks. So um, we start um, in the west. You can see down, or maybe you can't, but down in Wellers Bay, and each blue dot represents a half day. So uh, the first day we stop in Brighton and then finish at Trenton. Second day uh, we lunch at Belleville and finish at County Shores on the Prince Edward Shore. And then the third day we're coming this way and going to stop at Hay Bay, the old Hay Bay Church, for lunch, and then finish at the United Empire Loyalist Campground. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to come up to Napanee Town itself because, uh, well, it didn't fit. And anyway, there's nowhere here uh, suitable for landing um, because there will be 10 boats of those boats that you saw a minute ago there will be 10 of those boats and then there's a rest day and then the second part of the tour is in the Thousand Islands which is going to be nice too um, so I'd like to invite uh, you all to um, uh, perhaps come down to Hay Bay to meet the participants uh, for, uh, at lunchtime have lunch with us um, I want to uh, um, want to uh, open that invitation. The second uh, thing that I want to tell you about is going to happen because the World Rowing Tour is coming. It's the Quinty Water Sports Fair. And this is going to happen uh, in Belleville the day before the World Tour starts. The concept is that all organizations related to non-motorized water sports, paddling, sailing, rowing, uh, both clubs, equipment suppliers, and everybody else, service suppliers, will all be uh, able to show what they do um, on, in Zwick's Park in Belleville. And the idea is that uh, we will show the people of the region, and by the region I mean everywhere from Brighton to Napanee, the whole Quinty region, and Prince Edward County, about the opportunities that there are on the Bay of Quinty um, and encourage people to get out on the water in uh, non-motorized sports. So that's what uh, I came here for. We have um, a, a grant from the city of Belleville for, bu for publicity and promotion of these events and we'll be using that mainly in the week or two before uh, the World Tour and the, and the Water Sports Fair. Um, I would like to uh, inquire whether Napanee would like to supplement that or whether you would like to, for example, sponsor the lunch at Hay Bay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to open it to open it for questions here, Councillor Pennell and then Councillor McCormack. Uh, thank you, Three Worship. Welcome. Um, I'm a very uh, big proponent of our waterway. Um, if you had a big enough boat, whether it be motorized or not, from our dock you can go anywhere in the world. And that was just fantastic. And now, from 50 different countries you said? or No, 12 different countries. 12 different countries around the world. Are 50 gonna, participants. Yep. Right. So 12 different countries are going to come to us. And that's fantastic. And I applaud you for that, for, for having make this happen. Um, when you... When you talk about the lunch, is there some kind of a spe specific dietary, or what would you be looking for for that, for the rowers and, and, and support staff and stuff? What, what are you talking about? Oh, well, the, uh, the friends of the old Hay Bay Church uh, are going to put together the lunch for us. Okay. Um, so all I'm asking for is a contribution from uh, Napanee towards the cost of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great, thank you. I, I, I went onto your website and I, I read all your press releases and stuff and uh, amazing and, and hopefully if we jump on board that you can put our logo on your website as well, it would be great, so it's uh, great. But uh, anyway, I, I welcome you and I look forward to this, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McCormack. Thank you, Your Worship. Well, this happens to be in my backyard and if my wife is watching live tonight, she's gonna be upset that she didn't know about this because she's an avid rower but I'll deal with that when I get home. Um, how much are you looking for? Um, well, a contribution towards either the promotion or the uh, lunch of $1,000 would be very generous. 
All right, well, I would fully support that. And if the town can't do it, we have other organizations that, uh, that could manage that. I just have a bit of a question because knowing the area, uh, just having attended a reenactment, uh, uh, Lake Ontario, um, when the waves pick up, it's a real challenge for, uh, for boaters and, and rowers included. So what's your contingency uh, regarding the, uh, the weather when it picks up? Right, so um, when we did the dry run last September, we did hit some, some windy days. Yep. <laughs> and that was the intent of doing the practice run to, to learn about the uh, potential problems. The boats we're going to use are called coastal rowing boats, and they're quite different from the racing shells, which you'd have seen in the Olympics. Um, they have a, a, a lower deck, and underneath the deck is air pocket, and any water that comes over flows out the stern. So these boats are used uh, in very rough water. In fact, uh, the latest trend in rowing is beach sprints, where people actually uh, race out through surf in this type of boat. Um, so we expect that, uh, or we know that these boats are quite capable in, in all sorts of, in, in any of the type of weather we're going to see in the Bay of Quinty. Um, the only thing that uh, we're scared of is things like thunderstorms. Yeah. If we have to cancel uh, half a day's rowing or even uh, a whole day's rowing, uh, we will have uh, onshore activities planned that we can jump into at short notice for the participants. Uh, uh, you know, people coming from Ontario, they come to row, and if you can't row, well, it's not so bad. But if you come from Europe or somewhere, you really want to. <laughs> sure. Yeah. All right, thank you. Anyways, I'm in support. Any further comments uh, or questions? Councillor Richardson? Uh, just, just briefly, Worship, I'll uh, echo what we've already heard from Councillor Pinnell and Councillor McCormack. Even though you're not coming up the Napanee River, you are exposing yourself to a vast majority of the town of Greater Napanee uh, going down the Long Reach and then into the Hay Bay Church. So um, I, I think it's a good opportunity for our community uh, to be showcased and, and, and really to showcase uh, what we have. I mean, we've been blessed uh, with the body of water called the Bay of Quinney and, and Hay Bay and, and the Napanee River. And, and any opportunity we can get to exploit that, uh, I think we should take that because it, it is one of the best areas in the world. So um, if we can maybe direct staff. I, I don't want to offer up something that I don't know we can do, but would you look, be looking for some type of resolution, Your Worship, to, uh, to assist in any way we can? Madam Clerk, normally uh, we would uh, note and receive for deputations, but it seems that uh, Council has the, uh, has the want to try and put something in front of us this evening and maybe not wait until uh, new business to make a decision. So what would, be your, uh, what would be your direction that we should take on this, please? Uh, through your worship, I believe it would be reasonable to refer this to staff to um, explore whatever options could be su supported for this event. I don't want to, as uh, was alluded to, I, I don't want to propose to say what those options might be, but uh, without looking into it. Or the other way that we could do it is if a, if a council member wished to um, make a motion uh, to support with, uh, with staff input and, and be able to put forward uh, uh, to the organization through Mr. Jepson uh, an answer for uh, financial support within three or four days. Willing to make that, uh, Councillor McCormack is yeah. making that? Yes, please. Go, go ahead. May or may I add something to that, please? This sure. sounds, this is a wonderful concept and I, I'm really appreciative of the time and effort you have already put forward into bringing this. Um, I think this is also a perfect opportunity to partner with Naturally LNA. It certainly is for promotion, and I'll explain that in a second. So you're seconding the motion? Yes, please. Seconding the motion, um, explore, and also to use all tools available, such as Naturally LNA, certainly Bay of Quinney Marketing, uh, and our own communication staff to get all the information that we can out on this to promote it for uh, for the event. Would that be it? Council in agreement? I kind of wordsmithed that myself. I'm sorry. 
That's good. All in favor of the motion? Motion is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, I think everybody was impressed by uh, A, how exciting it can be for, for non-motorized and the fact that you picked our place. So I'm sure that you'll hear from staff within the next two or three days with a positive response. And I thank you for bringing this to our community. The next time though, I really would like to see you, uh, although I love to see it at, at Old Hay Bay Church, maybe we can do a demonstration to get this working in our area in the Napanee River itself. Yeah. Okay, well thank okay. you very, thank you thank very you. much. If I may have one last word, maybe Certainly. I just could say that the intents are one to give these 50 participants a real uh, treat here in the Bay of Quinty that they'll take home to the various countries they're coming from. And, but secondly, as far as is possible to get the people of Napanee interested so they know about the World Rowing Tour, they know about rowing, and they start to uh, get interested in water sports themselves. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Thank you very yeah. much, sir, for coming forward tonight. Thank you. I Thank will you. take a motion to note and receive, please. It wasn't yep. built into the other motion. Do you want to build that into the last motion? Yeah. Sure, that's what we just did. Thank you very much. So I think our next deputation is coming in by Zoom. Um, Nathan, who has been um, running this program for us on a staff basis, is here. But I think we have Janet Pringle coming forward with a deputation. <coughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll defer to Janet, and if I have any other comment, I'll come after. I have Janet coming forward. Uh, Janet, welcome this evening. Can you hear us okay? Yep, I can hear you Good. fine. Can Great. you hear me? Uh, we can certainly hear you. Thanks very much for coming forward with us tonight. I'll let you go ahead with your presentation, please. Thank you so very much. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor and members of council. My name is Janet Pringle, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Greater Napanee Sport Hall of Fame. Just a little background, the Napanee Sport Hall of Fame was created in 1997 with seven original inductees. 2022 will mark the seventh induction class. The previous induction years falling in 1999, 2001, 2003, 2007, and 2017. Prior to the 2022 inductees, there's been 27 individuals inducted into the Hall of Fame, which is placed on the wall of the FPC just inside of the Goodyear Ice Pack. So our inductees in the 2022 induction class of the Napanee Greater, uh, sorry, Greater Napanee Sports Hall of Fame will be bringing this total number of individuals into the hall to 29 members as we induct Roger Mills and Patty Sharp. Roger, a longtime resident of Napanee, started playing sports at a young age, taking an interest in both hockey and softball. He carried his love for sports in coaching, managing, refereeing, and as an executive member at some capacity for over 30 years, with many of the teams he coached having success at both the provincial and national levels. Not only has Roger had an impact on the field. He's also volunteered his time for events hosted in the community, including multiple fast pitch championships. Patty Sharp instantly took to the role of executive member and stuck with it for more than 30 years as softball Napanee. Although in the background and away from the on-field performance of sports, Patty was an integral part of ensuring that many events and organizations had success through tireless roles as both secretary and treasurer of organizing committees such as the 2008 U18 Women's Championships, the 2010 Tankard, and the 2012 Canadian Junior Championship. The induction ceremony is going to be held on Thursday, September 15th, where Roger and Patty will be recognized for their contribution to sport at the SPC Banquet Hall. Family members and friends will be welcome to attend the evening with speeches from nominators and inductees along with a small reception with appetizers and drinks. I'd like to give a special thanks to the selection committee. A huge thank you to the 11 members who participated in the process, taking time and effort to ensure these individuals get the recognition they deserve 
and also to Atura Power through their community fund. The funding has been secured to cover the cost for the induction, as well as any auxiliary costs such as plaques and photos. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, any questions? Thanks, Janet. Any questions uh, for Janet on this? I hope everybody's available to attend. Go ahead, Terry. Yeah, I, I, it's more of just a uh, comment. I, I would just encourage everyone that's watching and those that aren't to to attend the the SPC uh, the arena uh, sometime during their day and, and take a look at the wall. It, it's a very very impressive. If you want to learn anything about the history and the sports in this community, it's extremely extremely impressive. And uh, take the time, go up, read the names, read what they've done for this community. And uh, I have to admit, I'm quite humbled every day I walk in there and I look at that wall. So uh, I would just encourage those folks, to, anyone in the community, whether you're new or you've been here forever, to go up there and take a look at it. So it's very impressive. Thank you, Councillor yes. Richardson. Any further comments or questions? I know, having been part of it uh, for a couple of the uh, couple of the different inductions, uh, that it's great to see it carried on. We we had a lapse of ten years, um, and now it's done once a term. The, the people that are on the committee now will decide how it goes forward and so on. But it's it's a very good process, and I thank all the people that were part of it, and Nathan in particular. I'd like to thank you for all the work that you, you did. This this was nice to be able to just have somebody else do all the correspondence and so on. So you were a great part of it, and thank you very much. And I know that you had a great interest in it as well. Thank you very much, Janet. I hope, uh, I know that we'll all put that on our calendars and, and we'll be part of it. And, and thank you for being a big part of, of the event as well. I would take a motion Thank to you. okay a motion to note and receive the <coughs> deputation. Councillor Richardson, Deputy Mayor Kaiser, all in favor of that motion. Motion is carried. Thank you. <coughs> we'll go on to correspondence. Correspondence for information. You have correspondence for information dated July 12, 2022. You have a recommendation to receive. Deputy, or sorry, um, Councillor Pinnell, seconded by Deputy Mayor Kaiser. Any comments or questions or anything anyone wants to pull from the list? Okay, we'll go with the uh, with the receiving first, and then we'll uh, get take a motion to, to to discuss a particular one. All in favor of the motion to note and receive. Motion is carried. Councillor Pinnell, you have one that you wish to separate and speak to. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to uh, separate item number one from the township of Matashawan and to uh, provide a letter of support to have uh, mailing addresses on the voters list for the upcoming election. Okay, would you like to make that by way of motion? I would, for, okay. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Deputy Mayor Kaiser seconded. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion. Motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you. Items for discussion. Community and corporate services. Annie. Welcome, Annie. Thank you, Your Worship. Before you is the train station facility use report. I am available should council have any questions. Council, questions to or comments to Annie on the uh, on the report and the request. Councillor McCormack. Thank you, Your Worship. Just a comment. I'm happy to see that we're finally putting uh, this facility to uh, to use. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, um, Annie. Do you see any spin-off benefit? I mean, if we have that tenant in there. Uh, they're likely to contribute to some of the upkeep and maintenance, and that's that's a good thing for the long-term lifespan of the building. Do you, do you see that? Yes, absolutely, through your worship uh, to Deputy Mayor Kaiser. Um, there have been many discussions with the volunteers. They have said they'd be more than happy to ensure the cleanliness and everything of the outside of the building, as well as the inside, so I can absolutely see that going forward. Good, thank okay. you. Councillor Pinnell. Thank you, Mayor, uh, through you. I have a few questions, Annie, if that's okay with you. Um, when we're talking about the lease on yearly lease, uh, is there an indication of how long, how many times the lease will be renewed? 
or up front so that we're not in indefinite time? Through your worship, at this point, uh, Councillor Pinnell, there has not been a set number of years or anything that the facility would be requested. Um, I can go back to the uh, organization and see if they have a timeline for that. Okay, thank you. And is that portion of the train station has power and, and hydro? Or, uh, sorry, power and hydro. Power and heat? Uh, yes, it does. And who would be responsible for that? Uh, through your worship, at this time, the town would maintain uh, and continue to pay for those. Okay, so just as a suggestion, maybe this is something that we could look at putting the internet controls on it so that we can make sure that the heat isn't left on for like what North Red was like for a while. So that's just a, a suggestion, so thank you. Okay, anything else from council? Council, you do have a recommendation uh, to receive for information and further that we authorize staff to enter into a lease agreement for $1 per year for, with Morningstar Mission for the use of the west se section of the train station located at 301 John Street, Napanee for the Morningstar Furniture Program. And further that council authorizes the mayor and the deputy CAO to execute, execute a lease agreement with Morningstar Mission for the use of a portion of the train station. Council, staff yes, recommendation. Thank you, Mayor. Yep, by Councillor Johnson, seconded by Councillor McCormack. Sorry, I'm going to go to, because I finally saw, I just caught Bob's hand coming up. Councillor um, Norrie seconded that. No further comments? All in favor of the motion? Motion is carried. Very useful, uh, useful for that. Thank you very much for bringing that forward. I see Mr. Stinson and Mr. Williams who do a, tr and thank you, Annie, for the report a tremendous amount of work with the mission and I know how hard it has been for them to try and find a spot to keep the furniture. Um, so thank you very much gentlemen for bringing it forward. It's uh, well done and thank you. 7.2 Growth and Expansion Services Planning Report PLOPMA 2021-069 and PLZACO 2021 070 Richmond Mobile Home Park Extension Planning Report. Michael, do you have anything you wish to add to your report to bring to our attention? Uh, thank you, Worship. Nothing further to add. Uh, just uh, to recap for, for Council, the public meeting associated with these applications was held on May 24th. Um, at that meeting, there were some concerns of Council, um, I believe, which were conveyed from some of the existing residents in the, in the park. Uh, about potential traffic related concerns. Um, there was also some comment regarding uh, existing location of the community mailbox uh, within the site um, and um, comments around uh, trees and the parkland and such. Um, just to, uh, to let the let, let council know the, the property owner, one of the property owners is in attendance this evening and can, can answer any questions that uh, uh, council might have. Uh, but staff are recommending approval this evening uh, of the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment to permit the expansion of uh, the mobile home park. Um, the traffic related concerns, the, uh, the, the traffic impact study did not identify a, a need to uh, modify the existing entrance onto driving road or add an additional entrance. Uh, but I believe the property owner can elaborate on, on what may be some future plans to help alleviate any concerns there if, uh, if he's at liberty to discuss those. Um, and the community mailbox location, uh, which was uh, brought up as a concern at the public meeting, um, that possible relocation of that can certainly be, uh, be captured during uh, detailed site plan review uh, and comment from uh, Canada Post can, can be sought to, to find a more suitable location. There's a likelihood that there would need to be another mailbox location for the for the, the expansion to the north, likely two, one for the south, one for the north, um, but we can certainly work with Canada Post to, uh, to address those concerns. So uh, if there's any questions about uh, what's before council this evening, I'd be happy to address and I believe we have uh, one of the property owners here who can also jump in if need be. Council, go ahead, Councillor McCormack. Thank you, Worship. Just curious, any more discussion on uh, possible construction access from 41? Uh, yes, through your Worship. Um, I'll, I'll let the, the property, owner, property owner elaborate uh, if he so chooses, but I believe there has been some strides made there to uh, essentially make a bypass to the north uh, to allow for construction. Uh, there is an existing entrance that the county has um, uh, given a, uh, I guess, a 
preliminary blessing to allow it to be used on a temporary basis. There's an agricultural entrance there which could be uh, converted for temporary construction purposes. Um, the property owners would need to seek uh, permission from the neighboring landowner, but I believe they may be amenable to that. That's good news. Any further comments or questions directed to either the owner or Michael at this point? You do have a recommendation before you um, to approve the official plan amendment and the zoning bylaw amendment subject to the conditions contained within. Moved by uh, Councillor McCormack, seconded by Councillor Pinnell. Any further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion, please. Thank you. We also then are moving 8.2 and 8.3, the bylaws. I'm going to, I will take a motion to cover both of them. 8.2 is the bylaw number 2022-051, official plan amendment, OPA number 43, Richmond Mobile Park expansion. Uh, combine that in the motion for 2022-0051 to amend zoning bylaw 02-22 of the town of Greater Napanee for Birch Street PLZACO 2022-019. First, second, and finally a third time. Deputy Mayor Kaiser, Councillor McCormack, all in favor of those bylaws. Both of them are carried. Thank you very much. Legislative Services, Administrative Monetary Penalties System. Aggie, you got moved up in the agenda, Aggie. We usually leave you till the very end. I'm stepping up in the world, aren't I, Mark? <laughs> <You are. laughs> Go ahead, Aggie, with your report, please. Um, I have nothing to add to my report, but I'm available for questions. Council, questions on, uh, on Aggie's report on uh, the system, please. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Richardson. Thank you, Worship. I, I guess my concerns are, and on the surface it doesn't seem much, but it would appear as this is another opportunity or circumstance where the provincial government has downloaded these services onto us. Uh, my concern is, is that um, reading the report, there's still... Um, and I'll jump right to the point where there's a, there's a comment about the, the people not getting their, their day in court. There really isn't a process, from what I can see, uh, that allows, that, that that's an independent process for folks that get tickets and have no chance to really to fight them. They're going to be, they can approach one person that's, that's a staff person, they can approach another person that's hired by the staff, but there's really no process. And the concern is, is that it's not independent enough or it's not as independent as going to a provincial courthouse because when you go to a provincial courthouse, obviously you're dealing with a justice of the peace who is by all means more than independent. So that's, I, I, I know it will speed things up, but it, it pains me to think that we are watering down that process. I mean, let's face it, the, the, the whole idea of um, a bylaw, it, it, it's not about collecting the fines, it's about uh, getting people to follow the law. And, 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 and I just think that it, it is going to subject our staff to some calls, and, and, and I know this because it, it's happened to me in a previous life, that people just don't want to pay parking tickets. So what they're going to do is they're going to call staff and they say, what can you do for me? And, and it puts the staff in, in a very vulnerable position. Uh, the way it is now, and, and we get them, and I've got the calls, and I still get calls with respect to the Provincial Offenses Act, that it's easy because it goes to our prosecutor. We have a prosecutor that, that's paid by us that goes to provincial court, uh, attends in front of a justice of the peace. He works for us, but he's the one that um, controls what happens, and, and, and ultimately, the Justice of the Peace makes that decision. So we're going to lose that from what I can see. 
and, and, and I'm not really fussy on that. I, I just think it'd be more fair if it does go. I mean, it's not our fault that the provincial fences court is, is so far behind. Um, it's been like that for 15 years. It was like that when I was there. Um, COVID didn't help it any, and, and I realize that. But uh, I, I just am uncomfortable not providing people with that opportunity to see somebody that's completely independent. And, and, and I guess where it drives at home is, is that the same process to a certain extent happens when instead of laying charges under, under the act with respect to uh, fire department violations, when we simply put the bill onto their tax bill, they have no process to appeal it other than coming to council. And, and, and I'm afraid that um, that's what's going to happen in this situation. So um, I, I know that, uh, I, I, and again, maybe it's because of my background, I just feel that everybody deserves their day in court um, and, and they should be afforded that opportunity. So. Uh, that, that's my hesitations towards, towards this process or system. It's not necessarily um, beating it up. I just, I just think this is another one of those situations where the province can't control what they're doing. They can't, they can't manage the Provincial Offenses Act, so they put something in the, in, in the act that says, well, if you guys want to do it, you can do it, and you can do whatever way you want to, because we really don't want to, and we really don't have the, the ability to deal with it. So. Um, those are my hesitations with respect to this process or this system, I guess. Certainly. Uh, if I could help while the members of the, the program itself, there are very strict regulations that need to be met to put a program like this in place, such as preventing flood flood and clearance, ensuring everybody gets treated to the same standard of service, while staff would be involved with the screening level as well. Um, there would be a very strict level of, um, there would be a very strict set of measures that they would have to meet. There would be an independent body, yes, hired by town staff. However, um, they would only be involved with each other when sending disclosure. They would still be a very independent body. They would be um, included in the formation of the policies that we would have to follow, including the provincial policies that need to be in place. Um, but staff would not have any kind of professional or unprofessional relationship with the hearing officer outside of an actual hearing. And I appreciate that, but um, it reminds me very much of the Police Services Act. In the Police Services Act, the uh, adjudicator, because it's not called a court, it's called a tribunal, the adjudicator is a policeman. The prosecutor is a policeman. And they both work for, if you were talking about the OPP, we are talking, they both work for the commissioner. So, um, Yes, there are provisions to try and keep it independent. I, I just don't believe that it can be as independent and transparent as the system that we have now, which is to attend in front of a justice of the peace. And, and we're not going to completely get rid of that process because we're still going to process part three, uh, part three summonses, right? So we're still going to need to have somebody on the payroll to, to prosecute those things. And so we're not going to get away with that. I'm assuming that the, the independent person that you're talking about, will that be the same person that does the prosecutions for the part threes or is that somebody else that we will hire that, that has the training or the ability to do that. I, I wasn't sure what that was going to be. So. so the idea has been tossed around about asking the same prosecutor to fill the position. However, if it proves to be a problem, we would be looking for a different party to fill it and we would put it out there for um, applications for um, staff to hire. And, and again, it's, it's, it's a cost that's being downloaded that is not necessary, I guess, is what my concern is. It may not be a big cost, but uh, it's still a cost that's going to be downloaded on the municipality as opposed to um, um, what we're paying for now anyway. So those, those, those are my hesitations. In any any uh, Anything else? Any other councillors wish to make uh, make a statement? Go ahead, Councillor <coughs> Pinnell. Uh, thank you, Through Your Worship. I uh, just have a question regarding on, on your report uh, that there's uh, currently over 60 part two tickets waiting to be assigned a docket. I'm just wondering, is there a statute of limitation on how long that these take before they're voided? So it's actually section 11 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms for the speedy trial. Um, and that was waived during COVID for a small portion of time. However, it has been reinstated. And, and what is that timeline? Um, so typically it's whatever is deemed reasonable. However, we are <coughs> approaching the end of that timeline. Um, and just one more question, please, mm -hmm. if I will. 
The, uh, the people that we need to hire, uh, I believe you called the hearing officer. Is that a full-time position or is that a, as, as needed person? As needed. Okay, thank you. Anything, anything else? Go ahead, uh, Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. When I first read through this, I thought it was quite innovative in moving a process forward and getting solutions to problems very quickly. Having listened to Councillor Richardson, I'm wondering in the rare case, like if you look at the flow chart at the end, in the rare case where um, after there's a hearing officer, if somebody still is not willing to accept the outcome, is there an opportunity then to take it to a, a more traditional legal method or is it just this and only this? So at that point through your worship, it would be civil litigation. Go ahead, Councillor McCormack. Thank you, Worship. So Aggie, it says here that uh, it's revenue, revenue generating. Um, relieve the province. Uh, provincial court of some of the partial backlog will also bring in additional revenue into the town from administrative fees, from late payments, of parking tickets, and so on. Do we have a rough idea based on historical uh, amount of tickets, whatnot, and it says how much are we looking at? Like, will it outweigh what, the, what it's gonna cost the town? So, yes, in my experience and from the research that I've done, there has been no municipality that has um, implemented this system that has lost money. Um, they have typically broken even, which is what you really want out of bylaw enforcement. You don't really want to be a <coughs> revenue generator. However, you would like to break even for the cost of your programs. So typically, when you issue a parking ticket, for example, you have the cost of the parking ticket, which would directly come back to the town. Um, currently, right now, we do have to pay MTO a search fee. We would still be charging that search fee if it gets to a late payment period. However, we would be adding that to the additional cost of the parking ticket. And then if they do not show up for a screening or a hearing, there would be an administrative fee for that. We would still go through the process of sending a parking ticket to plate denial through the MTO. However, it's just a different form that we would need to fill out. We already have the systems in place. It would just be switching it from waiting for the provincial prosecutors to assign us to a docket and just moving in-house, allowing for a, an exceptionally better service level. I'm going to ask a few questions here first. Aggie, can you give me an example of... I mean, this this isn't just COVID related. The courts have been backed up forever and ever and ever, and and most of these would be parking tickets. Would would they be infractions of that sort? Not not anything to do with any bylaw enforcement on on our level. All of them would be within a provincial court. That's where they would go to eventually, if or if they could, or if they don't agree with what uh, what if we go with this with the decision that's made at ours. Is that right? So under the Municipal Act that allows for this, mm -hmm. we would we do have to have the screening officer in place and then the hearing officer, yeah. but it is in statute that there is no court of appeal after a hearing officer, okay. in which case it would still be civil litigation. So right now, if you are unhappy with a result at a provincial offenses court, you do have the right to appeal it to the higher court. Mm -hmm. um, but after that, their, ru their ruling is final. So it's very similar. However, it's just an in-house process. So, so an example would be, I get a parking ticket. I don't like it and I want to fight it. I take it to, to at this point, 41 Dundas, and um, I disagree with it. Um, I, I may be very nice when I'm dealing with staff and saying, you know, what are my options here? I may be very nasty when I'm dealing with staff uh, because, because people are frustrated. So therefore, the, the service of customer service, the, the level of customer service is absolutely terrible. Um, so I see this as something to improve customer service. When somebody sees a ticket and it says Town of Greater Napanee on it, they're looking at us as being the ones that have put it there. Is this system, and I agree with, with what Councillor Richardson said, is it downloading? Yeah, well, th that's unfortunately something that's gone on. But I think that we do have to try and, and provide some sort of level of customer service uh, to, to people. Um, to try and do these, and it, we're getting them more and more and more. 
So uh, I see that, for instance, the city of Kingston has, has taken this on, and I'm sure you've researched all of this. City of Kingston, Prince Edward County, City of Vaughan, St. Catharines, Niagara-on-the-Lake, Oshawa, Waterloo, and the City of Toronto, which would all be single tier, whereas as we're not, and, and the county does reap some of the benefits from, uh, from fines and so on that are collected by them. So would I be right in saying that, that uh, option one is just to increase customer service as well as try and be uh, revenue neutral? As, as far as the downloading, that, that to me, with all due respect, is something that we have to fight at a different level. Are we looking to try and provide people with an option uh, and then work through the, the downloading of, of uh, of this sort of thing, which we don't want to do anyway. It's like collecting the county's taxes and education taxes, and then we still have to pay it out to them. Would I be looking at that in, in the right in the right way? And I, and I don't mean to lead you along, but I just see it as that. Yes, absolutely, Your Worship. So this just allows a better customer service standard first and foremost. So right now, if you were to get a parking ticket um, and you were not happy with it, although you may not be happy with it, you may be nice, you may be quite upset with the ticket. Um, if you do not have any um, proof or reason as to why the ticket is invalid, your only option is to file for contest, which would then put it on the docket if it's deemed reasonable by whoever staff member you'd be speaking to, which would typically be myself or Madam Clerk. Okay. Um, with this system, if somebody comes in and they are unhappy with a parking ticket, we would ideally have the uh, policies in place when this program rolls out. Uh, that they could have a firm timeline on when their scheduled hearing would be or when their scheduled screening would be, and that would relieve a lot of the frustration that I experience from day to day, okay. um, just from speaking to people who are waiting to be assigned a docket. Yeah. Okay. We're being invaded. <laughs> Go ahead, Councillor Richardson. Thank you, Worship. It just, it still doesn't address the fact okay. that... Um, there is no appeal process, and, and my concerns are is that there is appeal process in everything in life, but there's no appeal process in this. We're treating it as an absolute liability offense where you're guilty until you can prove yourself innocent, and you have no way to prove yourself innocent. And, and, and the ultimate is, is that you go in with a ticket, say, no, you, part, you were wrong, you, you owe the $50, so I want to take it to the next level. So you go see somebody that's being paid by the municipality, I want to take it, you owe 50 bucks, that's it. And then they walk out and they go, well, that wasn't fair. And then they say, well, I'm going to take it to the next level. And you say, there is no next level, sue us. And I'm going, I don't see where that's going to help our customer service at all. And uh, the other answer to it is that the guy comes in with a $50 ticket. You say, ah, don't get mad. I'll tell you what, we'll knock it down for 25 But that doesn't serve any of us any good. Mm -hmm. So um, the process that is out there now, even though it's broken, and it's not our responsibility that it's broken, it provides an opportunity for an appeal process. So even if you're convicted of that part two offense in, before Justice of the Peace, you can appeal it to the provincial court judge. There's an appeal process. There should be an appeal process to everything. There isn't with this process, and those are my hesitations, because it just isn't fair to somebody that says, listen, I got an excuse why I did that. Well, let's hear it. It's not good enough for me, so pay the ticket. There's got to be an appeal process as far as I'm concerned, and I apologize for that, but uh, uh, that's why I just, I just can't support it. Go ahead, Councillor Norrie. Sorry, thank you, Your Worship. Sorry, I, uh, some things cut in and out. If I understand this right, right now the taxpayer pays for course and just the pieces, pieces uh, we're going to ask our local taxpayers to pay more for another staffer to hear something that's already being heard just because it's delayed. Is that the gist of it uh, in a nutshell? Again, like I say, my sound is cut in and out, but I'm just reading this. Do I have it in a nutshell correct on top of the no appeal and so on? Aggie, I'll let you go ahead and answer that, please. So right now, um, through the court process, it is paid through the taxpayers' dollars. However, it would still be um, the same local taxpayers paying for the internal service. Um, we would be hopefully neutralizing a lot of that cost based on revenue um, from the actual parking fines or the fines that we do designate to issue under this as well as the administrative fee for processing times. Um, because right now, let's say you get a $50 parking ticket, the MTO tax on a late fee if it does get sent to um, plate denial and then it will be 
um, up to a late fee as well as the um, increase in fines once it gets to them. So from a $50 parking ticket, you were looking at um, typically a $10 MTO search fine from the MTO themselves, and then you're typically looking at another additional $50 charge from the MTO when it does get sent to plate denial. So you are looking at about $110, of which the town will see approximately um, 10%. And this is just par for the course for how these systems work. There's not a lot of revenue generated from issuing tickets through the provincial court system. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so essentially to somewhat repeat what you just said, right now we have the cost of writing tickets, staffing to do those tickets, but then they go to the POA court mm -hmm. where most of the collections on those fines stay there and very little if any comes back. Yes. So the taxpayer that's paying for, for our bylaw enforcement within this town isn't, if they get fined, that's not coming back to us, it's staying either at the county or at the provincial level. Yes. This would bring it in house. So on the financial side of it, this actually makes it more revenue neutral under this plan than we ever have been prior yes. for this municipality. I also, while I totally understand the appeal and that, that, you know, that entitlement to, to that next level of appeal, I see this, when you look at the list of bylaws listed here, parking, noise, dog control, waste, property standards, short-term accommodation, and possibly some of the building code stuff, this is a potential enhancement to our bylaw enforcement within this municipality. This is a stepping up to an improved level of surface for bylaw enforcement at a, in a way that actually might be something close to revenue neutral. I've been hearing for eight years that we don't do enough bylaw enforcement in a lot of ways and a lot of fronts. And I look at this as, hey, this is a new approach to taking the same old thing, doing it better, and at a near zero cost to our taxpayer. I think this is a good thing. If we can figure out the, uh, the appeal, I mean, ultimately, if they, if they have civil litigation in their back pocket, they still do have that one higher level. And with all respect, you know, if you get a parking ticket downtown, you're not likely to sue the town for a $50 fine. So I don't think that's a great risk. We're talking about some pretty significant things that's going to push people to that level. They might, uh, I'm trying to think of the right words. They might kick and uh, mutter about it as they walk out the room after paying $50, but at the end it's $50 uh, for a parking ticket that most people would ultimately concede that they probably parked where they shouldn't have in the end. They're just out for the 50 bucks. Now that's just a quick example. There's lots of other things covered in there, but I see this as an enhancement, something we've been asking for for a long time and a revenue neutral one at that. And if the province has finally given us the authority to do it in a way that keeps the revenue here, because for years we've seen it go to the county. Now, as a county councillor, I'm also aware that the impact is going to happen over there where there's going to be a reduction in POA income if we take some of these back. Uh, that'll be dealt with there. That's not our concern here tonight. So I'll leave it at that, but I, I'm inclined to support it just on the sense that we've been looking for bylaw enhancement for a long time. This is an improvement in service. It also provides a better level of service to the Appellant, if you will, who comes in and tries to say this isn't right or wrong and we can deal with it in a much shorter time frame face to face on site rather than uh, And I'll tell you my daughter got a ticket in Scarborough one time and that was sitting at the kitchen listening to some phone call to some person over in Toronto and it was on their schedule not on hers She had to be home for that call and you know, it, it's not it's not handy at all This is I see a pro improvement in a lot of ways except for the appeal process I just want to ask one question to clarify something here, uh, Councillor Richardson. I get a parking ticket. Um, I, 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 don't, I want to appeal it in the situation that we've got right now that we have to wait for the courts. That's not dealt with for a certain period of time. I go to renew my license. Because that has not been settled, will that keep me from renewing my license? So, no. Um, okay. As long um, as it's not been a closed okay. file by the court, you'll be allowed to renew your okay. license. Just wanted to check that for timelines. Go ahead, Councillor Richardson. Yeah, and, and, and sorry, Worship, I don't want to beat this up anymore, but uh, um, very rarely is, an, is, is any type of an enforcement agency re re revenue neutral. Uh, that just doesn't happen. Um, my 
problem. And again, I'll reiterate it that it's the heavy handedness that we're going to perceive to the public. Does it make it easier for the public? Yeah, but they're not going to be happy with what they're going to get. And that's, that's my problem. And, and if we don't provide, give them the opportunity of an appeal process. Um, if you think we have problems now, there's going to be even more problems. Because like I say, when you tell somebody that you're still going to pay the ticket, and they walk out the door and say, I'll take you to court. Well, you're going to do that, but it's going to be on your dime because you've got to sue us. And, and, and that, as far as I'm concerned, isn't a public relations advantage. It really isn't, where the process now is if you don't like it, you, you walk over to 41 Dundas Street, you sign the papers, and you say, I'm going to see the provincial court judge here. I didn't like the decision from the Justice of the Peace. I want to see the judge. And that happens. So um, that's, again, that's, that's why I can't support it. It's, it's the appeal process. It, it appears heavy-handed, and I don't think uh, we as a corporation, it's going to make us look like all we're going to do it is for the money. You're going to pay us. We're going to give you a ticket. You're going to pay us. And you've got no process as far as is appealing that or, or to taking it to court because you don't. That's the way the process works, sue us. And, and, and that doesn't help our public relations at all, as far as I'm concerned, anyways, that's my opinion, so thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Pinnell. <clears throat> thank you, uh, through you, Mayor. If, if this was to be approved tonight, is there some way that this could be done on a trial basis? I would have to refer to Madam Clerk for that one because I am not 100% sure. Through your worship, um, I am not entirely sure of that either, but I'm sure we could look into that. This report really is just to get this concept out in council to float the idea. There is quite a lot of legwork that would have to be done to bring this in. So before we went down and started doing all of that, we wanted to see how council felt about the idea first. Um, but we, we can certainly look into exploring what a trial basis might look like. I have only heard um, positive things from other municipal employees in other communities that I've spoken to about this, but that, that may be the staff perspective and not the resident perspective. Thank you. Go ahead, Councillor McCormack. Thank you, Worship. So the, again, it's another uh, example of a report that uh, has a, a lot of input and a lot of uh, back, you know, background work and all that, and I appreciate that. Um, but I'm glad that the clerk chimed in and said that um, this is an opportunity for council to uh, put some thought to it and maybe have some more discussion because in the recommendation here, I thought we're looking for either option one or number two, and the recommendation was to adopt number one. And to be honest with you, this evening, there's, and I've read this since it came out um, well, on the weekend, I'm just not convinced. And I'm not saying it's not the right thing to do, but I'm just not at the stage where I can wholeheartedly support it. So I'd like to be able to put this over and have more discussion on it before a decision is made. That's my feelings. Thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanted to reference the fact that this is not just about parking tickets. The bylaws affected were also about noise and dog mm -hmm. control, waste and property standards and short-term accommodations. For a lot of these other characters, categories, the people who are making the complaints through the bylaw process are often very frustrated by not seeing a speedy result. This would be, I see this as being a way to provide customer service on the other end so the person who's making the bylaw complaint can see a resolution within a reasonable amount of time. At this point in time, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe with property standards, we go through multiple steps to ensure that property standards are adhered to and then if everything goes south, as far as it can go south, we end up taking someone to court and it costs this community a lot of money. This would put the onus on the property owner who's not following the rules properly. Am I correct in that? Yes, so this isn't to replace any kind of legal processes that need to be followed in terms of property standards or orders for compliance under the <coughs> building code or any kind of orders. However, this would just um, expedite the fine process if we do need to lay them. However, we would still leave the ability to lay a part three information should things not um, pan out or should there be a repetitive issue that is not getting addressed. Okay, and good, good point too, uh, Councillor Johnson. I think we were fixating on, on parking tickets because it has been a bit of a bane um, for the past uh, year and a half. 
So council, um, we need to give some staff, uh, staff direction here um, as to, and it doesn't, certainly doesn't have to be decided on tonight. I, I think what they were looking for was receive for information uh, and further that council I don't endorse option one for adopting an AMP system for the bylaws as specified in this report and direct staff to develop the necessary plans, policies, and bylaws to do so. Who would like to try and get that so that at least we can look at it further? Because I think as several councillors have said that, that we do need to look into it uh, a little bit more. Go ahead, Councillor McCormack. Thank you, Worship. So simply, could we not just uh, uh, put this over uh, for a later date? to give us more time to have some discussion on this. So, but discussion with more with more information? What, what is it you're requiring? That's here? correct. Okay, so you would like to put it over until our next meeting? Yes, please. With what kind of information uh, are you well, looking to Well, give us time to uh, have discussions with uh, okay. uh, Aggie and the clerk and so on. I just have more questions, yep. and I don't want to... Um, vote on something that I'm not 100% comfortable yeah, with no. either way. I think we're all in the same boat. <coughs> yep. I second that. Second that motion. I, as I do so, can I, uh, can, can we investigate or, or maybe it's already known, are there any options that we could kick it back over to POA if, to, to get it back into the system for the appeal process. If we have one that's particularly difficult, or do we have to follow this flow chart, or is there a method for we can exit it and push it over if, if we find it's a, it's a difficult one or something? It's one or the other, it's not both. So it would be one or the other. Okay. I know, I know you're not. Madam Clerk, do you have what you need to uh, to move us forward on this? So just to be clear, the motion that I have is that council receive for information the report and further the council direct staff to report back with more information to a later meeting regarding the concerns raised at this meeting. Does that capture the spirit of, I can specifically note appeals process and potential trial period if that is. What, what I'm going to what I'm going to recommend what I'm going to recommend with this is because if we put it into what forum are we going to use to discuss and ask more questions? What I uh, just a second, Councillor McCormack, please. So what I would like to see in, is is that if Council has direct questions on a very good and thorough um, report, that if they've got more questions for Aggie, that she can prepare for the next meeting to have the answers. And, and uh, you know, it, it, I think that would make it, because we've only got so many council meetings left. This is something that needs to be decided on to get a lot of this backlog, if that's what council decides, the way that they want to go, or to alter it uh, to do other things and get information. So uh, could it be that questions relating to more information be directed to um, Madam Clerk and Aggie um, within, when's our next meeting? August? The ninth. August the 9th. Um, so within the next 10 days that questions are sent to, uh, sent to uh, Aggie and, and uh, Madam Clerk uh, so that they can gather the information. Does that sound reasonable, Council? Uh, otherwise, you, 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 we're just gonna be spinning our wheels at the next one. Thank you, Your Worship. That's all I'm looking for is just yep. a li little bit yep. more time to get some, some answers and, yep. and ask some questions to get a better understanding uh, before personally I vote on it. And we've had other occasions recently with uh, bylaw amendments yep. where we've been able to uh, you know, ask questions, get answers, and get a clearer understanding as to how to make a decision. Yep, not disagreeing, just uh, we... we uh uh, we do need to try and get some of this stuff moving at some point, or at least in place for the next council to deal with. Madam Clerk, do you have what you need? Any further comments or questions? Good conversation, agree or disagree. All in favor of the motion? Motion is carried, thank you. Thanks, Aggie. Legislative Services, Procedure Bylaw Update. 
Jessica. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, thank you to anyone who, everyone who slogged through the reading on that. I realize it was very long. Um, I, I hope that I covered all the high points in the staff report, but I am happy to take any questions on this. And I, and I will also note, it's not in the report, but council is certainly not obligated to adopt a bylaw at this meeting and can um, amend any bylaw between first and second readings if they so desire. Council. Go ahead, Councillor Richardson. I guess I'll start, Your Worship. Um, I'll reiterate what I said before, is I think this bylaw needs to be updated, but I'm not prepared to, uh, to update it to influence the next term of council. Uh, we've had four years to do this, and we didn't do it. Now we're going to do it at the 11th hour. I'm not prepared to do that. Um, with respect to your report, I think, I see that we have a letter from uh, Hubert Holgo with respect to closed. Is there anything? in the projected bylaw um, dealing with the closed session information that's, uh, that, that we've received via email? Or is there any consideration for the bylaw with respect to the, the, the length of email that we received? Through your worship, there is in the appendices to the bylaw, the appendix C speaks to um, clarifying what closed session may be used for, may not be used for. Um, recommending uh, specific templates for how staff do closed session reports, which greater enables uh, portions of those reports to later be released to the public um, on council's recommendation or staff's recommendation. Um, just hoping to build in a little bit more transparency about what closed session is and is not used for. Yeah, thank you. I think that's important. Um, Transparency with respect to closed session is, I think, the ult the utmost ultimate thing we have to look at, and uh, and I think we really need to do better with it. Um, there's transparency in, in everything in life, um, and I could use an example with respect to the criminal justice system that um, there's secrecy with respect to sealing warrants and Part Six authorizations, but there's also a process that when everything is said and done, there's an application process where those things can be opened. They may be redacted to protect some information, but they can still be opened. So I, I think it's important that we have to look at it because transparency, especially in today's world, I mean, we're doing everything by Zoom now, it is the utmost uh, ultimate uh, thing we have to look at. So um, that's what I would like to see. But like I say, I, I, my gut feeling on this is that I, I, I don't want to handcuff or I don't want to challenge the next term of council coming in by us making a decision on how we do business that would suit our purpose, but it may or may not suit their purpose uh, at the 11th hour. So that's my uh, thoughts on that. Thank you. Anybody else? Go ahead, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, just on that point that Councillor uh, Richardson just raised around closed meetings, I. I think it's important that we do develop a, a pretty clear policy of how uh, appropriate items are released from closed meetings in the correct timely fashion. For example, when we talk about land acquisition and disposition, there's a period of time where we need to keep it enclosed because we need that negotiating uh, position protected. But once we get past the closing date, there's a certain measure of information that should be released there's also some that should never, I think. But uh, I think in the past, our policy has been a little lax on how that happened and, and that it happened at the right timeline. That's one example of how some of those things maybe should be tightened up and more clearly policied out. Um, and those types of things in the <coughs> rules of procedure, I, I support. I do agree, though, that you know some of the stuff in here is, like uh, Councilor Richard said, 11th hour. Um, but uh, at the same time, as we pointed out at the start of the meeting, tonight is a special meeting of council because we're not scheduled to have one in July. I've never missed one. I've been on council for eight years, and this is my eighth consecutive July meeting. So maybe it's time to just make a July meeting a regular thing so we, we're not kidding anybody that it's not going to happen. But uh, that, I mean, those sort of things I don't think are, are groundbreaking, real you know, rocking the boat type of things. 
if it happens now or it happens in six months, I don't really, I, I, we're moving in the right direction, I think. Anything else from council? Go ahead, Councilor Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to say I like the proposal of splitting up some of the work and having the different kinds of committees so that this council in particular has been very passionate about getting involved in many of the details. There's no guarantee that the next council will be as interested. We hope they are, but there's no guarantee. There is, um, in this proposal, there is a clear path set out where councils com councillors will still be part of all of the conversations and share what they learn with other councillors. But meeting will be held every time we have a council meeting. We have had very few council meetings in the past four years that ended before 11 o'clock at night. It's, I can't imagine how difficult it is for staff to have to manage that on a continuous basis. And we look at bringing a new council forward for the next session and how many people are going to be willing to make that time commitment. I know when we first ran for council, people said, oh yeah, you have two hours for a council meeting, a little bit of reading and you're done. That is so far from the reality <laughs> that <laughs> it does, it really does become laughable. I think this is a really strong solution in streamlining that process, not so that people have less information, but they share information in a more timely manner and that the importance decisions are still made by all of council. I think the, the plan itself is good. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, and I, I was remiss in not saying this before, uh, but the Committee of the Whole Structure, the discussion we just had with Aggie about the uh, enforcement stuff, um, that's a perfect example of how the Committee of the Whole could have made it simpler and easier. It could have been a selection of this council that sat around and, and battered that around for a while and came up with a strong recommendation to come to council with council, so at least some council's support. Um, and as Councillor Johnson just pointed out, it would make the council meetings more streamlined, but it also increase the accountability. I'm still a bit on the fence of whether we should we should put it in as we're going out the door and, and let the next council be burdened with it or not. But I don't think it's a burden, actually. I think it's a, a move in the right direction. And I'll point out that in the last year, we brought on a new CAO and a new clerk. And at the time, I certainly saw it as an opportunity that new energy, new leadership, new vision would come in. And this is exactly the sort of thing that came with it. And, and this is one of the things we should really be openly embracing that that this is an evolution forward with a new f fresh set of eyes and a fresh set of thinking. So, um, you know, maybe it is the time to do it. Go ahead. Uh, I think in the, uh, the clerk's report, it suggests that we do have the ability to do that on as needed basis. And I'm just wondering how much have we done it on an as needed basis? Obviously there is an as needed basis, so have we done it? I mean, the provisions are already there in the current bylaw, so um, it's another tool in that toolbox that we may or may not have used. And if we haven't used it, maybe we should. But I'm not prepared to, to, to do a wholesale change. Uh, we've got one uh, meeting left prior to a lame duck situation. We've had four years to do this. We haven't. Uh, we, we've muddled our way through it. And, and just with respect to the long meetings, this term of council has... Uh, gained a lot of ground and we've, we've learned very fast and we've asked questions, we've been very engaged. Um, there, maybe there's a reason why the meetings have gone late. Because we care, because we work hard, because we want the best. Um, that's maybe why, so. And, and not to mention we've, we've gained a lot of ground. We've, we've, we've traveled a long ways in four years considering that we spent two of it in a COVID situation. Sometimes meeting in parking lots, sometimes meeting on Zoom when it worked. Um, we've traveled a long ways. So um, I, I just, like I say, the 11th hour, I, I'm not comfortable. Uh, I think the next term of council can, can build it the way they want to build it. I don't want to hinder them if, if this system doesn't work or that system does, that will be their decision to make. And, and that's uh, uh, how I feel that we should leave them in a good position. 
uh, to make those decisions to take the future of the town in the direction that they think it should go, so, and not to hinder them. Go ahead, Councillor Pinnell. Thank you, Worship, through you uh, to uh, talk with uh, Councillor Richardson. I guess uh, we did kind of have, uh, we did kind of strike this up a little bit with the uh, ATV bylaw. Um, that would have been kind of like, I would have called that a task force that had a start date and an end date um, sort of thing. On the other uh, boards that I sit on, that's, that's what we do is we call them task force. Um, but uh, with that being said, I, I hope that I'm fortunate enough to be sitting in this chair next year to be able to make this decision. But at this time, I, I can't support it uh, just with uh, how close we are to the end of our term. Anything else? Go ahead, Councillor McCormack. Thank you, Your Worship. I have uh, similar feelings. Uh, just personally, I would really be interested to see what the uh, formation of the next council is to have a better idea uh, as to how this would, uh, would work. And trying to be as fair as possible, but as Councillor uh, Johnson uh, uh, indicated, this council worked well together and we, uh, we dove into things that possibly had not been uh, done before. Um, so depending on what the outcome is in the next election, we might find ourselves with something similar or we could find ourselves with something that's uh, quite different than what we have now as far as uh, working together and, and getting things done. So I agree with uh, Councillor Pinnell. I'm not prepared right now to, to, to go with this. Anyone else? Well, I'm just going to make a couple of comments, and I'm not going to push on it. I think everybody knows how I feel uh, about this. I, I do feel that, that this council, uh, muddled is a good word. We had lots of stuff uh, put in front of us uh, that we had to work our way through. We have actually, in just about every meeting that we've had, we've been hybrid. I don't mean hybrid as in Zoom and, and in person. We've been hybrid as kind of like committee of the whole, but it's also kind of like a regular council meeting too. Um, I do believe that this was a five brand new councillors that started and nobody really knew of a lot of procedures. You had a new mayor in the chair, new deputy mayor. So um, we've been pretty loosey-goosey with the way that we do things, but we've also accomplished a lot. So if you get a lot of turnover, uh, again, um, the people that are coming in aren't going to, aren't going to recognize wh what things are until they're trained. If you have a lot of returnees, you may look at something, which is kind of why I lean to think, okay, let it sit and let you decide. If you have a lot of people return, then maybe you will decide to take on what, what is being proposed by staff. That have, we have asked to see um, how, how they can make us work more efficiently. It has been a very engaged um, council. Um, we really had no choice being in COVID. We had to be enga engaged. We had to be in each other's pockets, sometimes a little bit too much, sometimes as, as different groups. Um, but uh, we, you do have something before you. I still would like to see some changes made that would streamline, but certainly still engage and certainly maybe give people coming into this being more, more engaged in it than, than, uh, than they are now. But I'm not going to go any further in it because I know that you all know how I feel. I would have liked to have seen, uh, seen the changes made before we uh, go into the next term. But let, let somebody give me a, um, a motion as to how they want to go with this. And I want to thank the, the clerk for, for all the work in bringing this forward. It's not like it's going to disappear. Come on, somebody. Put his hand up. Oh, sorry, I didn't see it go up. Yeah. Sorry, Your Worship. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm happy just to note and receive the, the report. I mean, it's been a very good learning experience for us. It, it is, is on all of our minds. Uh, for those that are lucky enough to return, um, we know about it. We've been trained in it. We understand it. 
It's been helpful, but I mean, at this point, uh, I'm just prepared to note and receive it. Note and receive. Moved by uh, Councillor Richardson, seconded by Councillor McCormack. All in favor of the motion? Opposed? Two opposed? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Did, I didn't see your hand, uh, Councillor Nori. Were you voting for or against? I was in favor of uh, noting and receiving. Oh, noting and receiving? Okay. So I had one opposed and the rest were four? Four and two. Four and two, sorry. sorry. It's hard, hard to look on both sides at once and look forward. Okay, thank you very much. And again, Madam Clerk, thank you for all the work on, on this, which I know that you had some backup with it. Legislative Services, Council Staff Relations Policy. Jessica, again, please. Through your worship, as noted in the report, this is uh, primarily a bit of housekeeping. This is a legislatively mandated policy, um, and we're just looking to get this one in place before the next term of council. Council's wishes. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Uh, I, I kind of like this idea. I think uh, certainly at the start of every term, whether you're new or returning, it's good to be reminded of everybody's roles and responsibilities and, and the appropriateness of interactions and communications and such. Um, you know, we, we operate sometimes in close proximity to staff, but that doesn't mean any one of us has the authority to direct staff individually. So I, I think it's important to go through the training and have this, and this is exactly the sort of thing that needs to be included as a, as a new council begins, regardless if they're new or returning. So I'm in support of it, and I would even make the motion. Okay, making that motion. Staff recommendation. Seconding uh, was Councillor McCormack. Any further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion. Thank you. So we're at our two hour limit. Uh, let's take a 10 minute break, if we would, please.
Oh, at will. Go back up, please, uh, Katie. Okay, coming back into uh, session after a short recess, which we try to do every two hours. Uh, we are up to now 7.6 legislative services policy suite administrative policy. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Your Worship. This, um, wh while it may seem a little redundant to have a policy on policies, um, we have noticed through our review that there is just um, not a lot of consistency in how policies are structured or who is responsible for them or even what needs to be a policy and what is within the scope of um, department managers to, to manage and how they manage their departments. So this is really um, trying to lay that framework um, at council level to make sure that we are doing this policy work and um, management directive work consistently across the organization. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. So it really it's drawing a line between what's an internal staff management policy and what's a council direction set policy. And they both have the same name, and which is which, is that? Uh, no, we're, we're gonna call them management directives so that it is very clear that they're not the same thing and they don't get confused. Any other comments? Go ahead, Councillor Richardson. We get taxed on taxes, so why wouldn't we have a policy on policies? <laughs> <laughs> Council's wishes on this. So moved. Staff recommendation moved by uh, Deputy Mayor Kaiser, seconded by Councillor Richardson. All in favor of that motion? Motion is carried. Thank you. Bylaws. We only have one bylaw left this evening, which is 8.1, bylaw number 2022, to authorize a lease agreement with uh, Enterprise Fleet Management. Uh, I'm going to go for a first and second reading, and then I will open it to any other discussions. First and second reading, Deputy Mayor Kaiser. Seconded by Councillor McCormack. All in favor of that motion. Motion is carried, thank you. Any further discussion on this? I know that it was fairly intense and we certainly seem to be uh, in favor of what it, uh, what it was going to encompass. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Pinnell. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm not sure who, who can speak of this, but uh, at, at the end of the uh, lease agreements, um, what are we actually going for? Are we going for the full service on this? Uh, it really wasn't quite, <coughs> I wasn't quite sure. And uh, the, what is that, the uh, EFM card as well? Go ahead, Peter, thank you. Uh, three, three worship. Test, test. No. Sorry, Peter, thanks. Uh, through your worship, uh, the, as far as the maintenance agreement, there, there's op there are options there, and it's tailored to suit the municipal needs. So for I'll give you a couple of small examples. If we're looking into getting into, uh, uh, if we want to run snow tires seasonally, all that can be incorporated. So it's a tailored to fit, and that'll be worked out with, uh, within the staffing, um, within the staff discussions in the very near future. Okay, thanks. So we're approving a bylaw with empty forms here, and we're not sure if we're gonna be using those forms or not as part of, the, to uh, create part of this bylaw. Uh, three worship, so the, the, the finer details will be flushed out. Uh, but with respect, I can't speak specifically to the field portion of it, but it is something we're going to look into further. Um, but with respect to the, the maintenance and stuff like that, the turnover of the vehicles will be so, so frequent, we won't be getting into the major repairs that we're seeing today so that that maintenance program can be tailored to suit. Okay. Um, 
I'm not sure if we're on the same. If what I'm trying to say is 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 if I'm trying to portray it the right way, um, I just see a maintenance management agreement um, that needs to be dated and signed, and that's going to be part of, of the lease agreement or this bylaw that we're going to sign. However, the terms of this that we're going to sign may change. If, if I may interject, uh, only because Peter probably doesn't have it, but we had a discussion with Enterprise today and we talked about the specificity within the maintenance contract. Um, so we have it in terms of the full maintenance, all major minor repairs, recommended services, maintenance related towing, incidentals, fluids, things like that. So what you would normally get within a maintenance period, say of a five year vehicle that's under full maintenance where you take it in for all the checkups, all that stuff is included. Okay. So there are some exclusions, for example, the one we talked about today was um, if, if, if the vehicle goes in for an oil change every 5,000 kilometers and we decide to do one at 3,000 kilometers, that's not included because it's above and beyond the normal thing. What Peter was talking about in terms of maybe altering some of those things is if we want to, for example, buy snow tires with the vehicles and that would perhaps change the specificity around the maintenance agreement. Uh, I think in this case they'd probably go with, I think they talked about an all-terrain tire as opposed to uh, winter and summer. But we do have the full maintenance schedule from Enterprise, Enterprise Fleet Management, okay. which describes what all those things are. And, and quite frankly, it is what you would typically find in a new vehicle that's under warranty, say for five years, 80,000 kilometers that you would typically get. Does that answer your question? It does, yes. Okay, thank, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Okay, Councillor Pinnell, anything further? Go ahead, Councillor Johnson. Quick question. Thank you, Mayor. Um, do we have anything in here that ensures that maintenance that re is required is done in a timely manner? Uh, three worship. Uh, so this was discussed at one of the meetings, and basically there, there's a, there's a maintenance schedule that's set up, and there's reminders. So for example, to go back to the oil change uh, scenario, if uh, the schedules are set, and we're not following it. We get reminders, and there's an engine failure. Uh, that won't be a, a warranty issue. That the, the town will be liable for that. So. Go ahead. Sorry, Mayor. That's not what I meant. Um, if the vehicle needs an oil change and you take it in to get an oil change, and because we're getting a great price on our oil change, yeah. they wait three days to do it. Is there a consequence to that from the enterprise point of view? I don't want. What I'm asking is, we don't want our vehicles always being the last one serviced. Okay. I can take that. I think what the discussion we've had is they have agreements with vendors that mm -hmm. we're not going to sit around waiting for oil changes. Okay. Right? And that the same thing is if you buy a, a certain brand of vehicle, you go to those manufacturers for your warranty, then we would be doing the same thing. And, and we do have managers of the fleet from an enterprise perspective who will work with our staff to make sure this is done on a timely manner. That's what I was looking for. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So are we ready for the second and final reading? Moved by Councillor McCormack, seconded by Councillor Richardson. Thank you, Peter. All in favor of the motion. Bylaw is passed. Thank you. Statements by members. Go ahead, Councillor McCormack. Thank you, Worship. So this past week, there was a serious collision on South Shore Road between Third Concession and Quaker Hill. A motor vehicle apparently traveling at a high rate of speed lost control, hitting a large farm implement driven by a local farmer. The farmer sustained minor injuries. However, the two occupants of the vehicle were transported to hospital with serious injuries. The posted speed limit on that stretch of roadway is 80 kilometers per hour. The posted speed elsewhere on South Shore Road is 60, except between County Road 25 and Dorland. And along this stretch of South Shore Road, there are multiple cemeteries, pedestrians, cyclists, farms, farm equipment, uh, which are moving slowly. There's uh, riders on horseback and the Conservation Authority boat ramp, as well as Old Hay Bay Church, which is open for tours. And ironically, where the road has the sharpest curve is where the posted speed is the highest. And uh, so my request is that uh, the posted speed be changed to 60 from 80 kilometers an hour. And uh, I did uh, <coughs> send this off to the clerk earlier, so I believe that Peter has some information as to how we go from here. 
um, a lot of, lot, of, lot of complaints from the residents about the speed on that stretch of road. And then ultimately with this accident, it's uh, really uh, brought it to, uh, to light. Thank you. Okay, okay go ahead, Peter. Thank uh, you. Through worship, um, our, our existing policy that we have for speed reductions is dated. Uh, it's missing a bit of key information, so it requires to be updated. Um, one of the key things that the current um, that the current policy is missing is basically the first step that would yield you the most significant returns with respect to uh, conformance to people doing the speed limit. So typically, what staff try to promote is that if somebody if if somebody has concerns, the speed in an area, they can notify us right away. And what we'll do is we'll set up monitoring devices so we can start acquiring some data. And after we have enough data, we evaluate that to see what, what is actually happening. So I'll give you some examples of what has happened historically. Um, almost every time that, that we set one of these, thing, uh, one of these uh, devices up in response to a speed complaint, between 85 and 95% of the people are doing at or below the speed limit. A very small, margin of, a very small number of people are doing marginally above, and then there's the one-off. So that, that's pretty typical. So what staff does is we work with, we, we work with local OPP and they'll target those one-off people to bring them back into conformance if that's what the problem is. If we find that it's a widespread problem and then it's a, a different avenue that we go down. So long story short, what, what staff would recommend is that we'll start to, the, we would recommend that we start with the, the data collection and see what's actually happening on the road. Um, the downside of jumping straight to the finish line to dropping speed in an area is it can create a problem on the other side of the coin where if it's a, if it's an area that, uh, if it's an area that should be 80 and we arbitrarily take it down to a 60, uh, our OPP won't like it uh, for starters because what it's going to do is going to create uh, enforcement issues on their end where it, you know, if it's, if it's not warranted to do so, people will have a, have great difficulty to comply with that. So we, we, we take those decisions very, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of analysis goes behind it and a lot of close work with OPP before, before we'd make a recommendation on that. Go ahead. I can go again. Sure. Um, I'll go along with it, yeah. but I don't think that's the solution. Um, I don't think that this should have been an 80 all along, and um, I've seen the uh, I've seen the results of uh, speed surveys done before, and the outcome never seems to justify the request to change the speed to a lower uh, a lower amount. As far as uh, uh, you know, re reducing it to 60 is not going to increase the uh, the uh, OPP's uh, enforcement because they don't come out in the south end as it is and uh, the purpose here is uh, for the farmers and the equipment and the people that are on the roadway uh, to be able to use it safely. So if we have to go the route, Peter, uh, and that's the policy, fine, but uh, I'm pretty sure there's, uh, there's, there's the ability also to have uh, residents uh, sign up uh, sign a petition if, if it's required. I think it's it's the kind of thing where um, it's most probably the right thing to do and the policy might just be a, a hindrance to, to getting to that result, but I'll go along with it for now and we'll see what the outcome is. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, through your worship, I can, I can reassure you that the, the data acquisition is actually a fairly quick turnaround time. So this isn't a uh, a, a stall tactic per se, that this is going to drag us on for months and months. That stuff can be implemented with relative ease and we can capture da data on that pretty quickly to see what we have to start with and then st start those discussions with OB OPP immediately. Okay. Uh, if we see those one-offs, then they're pretty effective targeting because it'll give time of day. Uh, there's several instances where they've uh, been able to catch people, you know, the, the chronic the chronic speeder who gets up late and can't get to work on time and speeds at the same time every day, they'll catch those people very quickly. So I appreciate that, but uh, the part of my comment here is that the worst part of the road has the highest uh, posted speed limit. And it's just, it, it, there's no, no sense to it. Um, as you get further down towards County Road uh, 25, where the road is in much better condition, 
the speed limit drops to 60, and as you go the other direction and you get close to Dorlam, the, the speed drops to 60 again, and uh, it should be, it's a smaller stretch where it should be, it should be 60 all the way along because the, 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 it's a, the worst curve and the, uh, the shoulders are in poor condition. And so I, I'll appreciate if we uh, start the process and uh, see what the outcome is, but um, we'll go with that. I just wanted to bring that to uh, everybody's attention tonight. Okay, thank you, thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm going to make a suggestion um, here, and I, I'm, we're into statements by members. And, and um, Councillor McCormack, were, were you on council when Salmon River Road came forward for a speed reduction? No. Or was, was that the last term? I think uh, the one that I remember was uh, Big Creek or Little Creek. It was, you're thinking yeah. it was last term. Sam. It was last term. Yeah. Sam, if, if you take a look at Salmon River Road, it would, it, it, there was, uh, he came forward with a video presentation. And a petition. And, and uh, so much information. Uh, and theirs was Hills. And, and I don't disagree with that, with that road, what you're doing. And it just might aid, um, uh, Peter, Peter, in doing it. Um, I know that you have lots of uh, lots of connections with the people that live there. Um, so it, it, theirs was a petition, and the, the gentleman that brought it forward, I think by the end of it, I believe that it might have been Councillor Shank just said, "How can we say no yeah. when, when it was so well presented?" So just a suggestion. A lot of work, but a suggestion. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, and thank you, Peter. Any other statements by members? Councillor Richardson. Thank you, Worship. I just want to take this opportunity to thank Brianna Clement uh, on behalf of the, uh, the Heritage Committee for sure um, for the work that she's done with the Heritage Committee and for the Corporation of Town and Apennine. Uh, congratulations to her. She's moving on to greener pastures, and uh, uh, I'm very, very happy for that. Uh, I know her mom and dad are probably watching tonight. I just want to pass on to them that they raised a very good kid and uh, congratulate them and, and congratulations to Brianna. I was hoping she was going to be here tonight, but uh, she sneaked out without being here. So I appreciate everything she's done for us in the Heritage Committee. Thank you, uh, Councillor Richardson. There's no one in this room that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't agree with the statements because uh, Brianna has, has been a, a, a great person to work with. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Worship. Echo Councillor Richardson's comments for sure. Um, but uh, I wanted to speak to the music by the river, which happened on Sunday. Uh, Arts and Culture made a decision to go ahead with that this summer. Uh, we had two acts that performed on Sunday. It was fairly well attended. Uh, one of them was uh, a daughter of one of our senior staff who was performing for her first time on a live stage and did very, very well. Um, I will also want to share that we have filled out the next three events which happen every other week starting Sunday past. Um, each of those we have attempted to schedule three live acts for each afternoon but still running between one and four on Sunday afternoons in the park. So I think it should be a good event. Just wanted to highlight the, the hard work of the committee and of our staff on that committee uh, to make that happen. Perfect. Thank you. Any other statements by members? Seeing none, uh, we have a recommendation before us that we adjourn into close, resolve ourselves, resolve itself into closed session in order to discuss two matters related to the potential disposition of land and a matter related to labor relations. Um, Deputy Mayor Kaiser, Councillor Richardson, all in favor of the motion? Motion is carried. Thank you.
sent, he sent you. The <coughs> says everything froze up and pole. dropped off, so he says. You know that one? Hey. Pull, pull. Bob just realized he could make last call, so he hoofed her. What? Somebody pulls pull. Okay, coming back out of uh, closed session. Okay, we're live. We're back live again. Coming out of closed session, uh, within closed session, council uh, received uh, information on two matters related to potential disposition of lands and gave staff direction to staff and received information related to labor relations. Did I do that properly? Yes, I did. Um, I will need a resolution. I will need um, someone to move and second the following resolutions. Um, the council declare surplus to the town's needs land described as concession one, part lot 19, <clears throat> roll number 11210600202620. And advertise as such, and further that council authorize staff to obtain an appraisal for the property, and further that council authorizes the CAO and clerk to execute all necessary documents and take all actions necessary for the sale and transfer of the property as described in the confidential staff report of the general manager of community and corporate services. I'll take that as a separate. Uh, Separate motion moved by Deputy Mayor Kaiser, seconded by Councillor Richardson. All in favor of that. Our second motion coming out of uh, closed session was that Council receive for information the confidential staff report, legal advice, and update, read the road closure application in brackets when, and further that Council support option two of the report and deny the road closure conveyance request and leave the road allowance open as a means of pedestrian passage to the water. And further that council direct that the contents of the confidential staff report be made public. Moved by Deputy Mayor Kaiser, seconded by Councillor McCormack. All in favor of that motion. Motion is carried, thank you. Leave. All I have is the bylaw confirming the proceedings of the corporation of uh, the town of Greater Napanee at their meeting of July 12. 12th. Thank you. Thank you very much. First, second, and third reading. Deputy Mayor Kaiser, Councillor McCormack. All in favor of that motion. Motion is carried. Motion for adjournment. Uh, Councillor Richardson. Councilor Pinnell, all in favor of that motion. Motion is carried. Thank you. Good night. Did you strike me? Pardon? Did you strike me? I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we you weren't paying attention. <laughs>